and welcome to the program. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, one of the biggest drivers of inflation over the last year or more has been the energy markets and one of the bigger battles at the state legislature is going to center around energy. So it's a good time to bring in Buddy Haston, CEO of the Electric Cooperatives of Arkansas for his perspective. Good morning. Good to have you with us. Before we dive into any of that, I want everybody to know a little bit of background about you that you used to work in nuclear submarines under the polar ice cap, which terrifies the crud out of me. <laughs> what is that experience like for months at a time being in sub-zero temperatures below the North Pole? Uh, well, you get a lot of special training <laughs> to, uh, yeah, it is uh, interesting. Going under the ocean is one thing. So some people would say, do you get claustrophobic and uh, are you scared to be under the water? And I'd say, by definition, if you're gonna ride around on a submarine, that doesn't bother you. <clears throat> but when you go into the polar ice cap, there are large swaths of ice that are too thick for the submarine to come up. Yeah. So imagine if you had a fire or some reason you needed to come up, you wouldn't be able to. <clears throat> so we do a lot of specialized training. We, we learn to map out places that we can go, but it does require a much more focused uh, set of operations to operate under the ice. But, uh, and then we, our sub surfaced uh, three, four times under the ice, and I personally was the guy uh, giving the orders for a couple of those, so it is, it is pretty cool. Well, I think it's probably good training for CEO of a major company too, <laughs> so to go through that kind of uh, drill. Thank you for being here, appreciate it. So, Thanks for asking me. Um, so let's talk about where the diversity of energy is coming <clears throat> from these days. I mean, we know that uh, coal has been on the decline. You've got all sorts of alternative uh, energy sources that are coming up here. The electric cooperatives keeps a very diverse mix of its where its uh, energy is produced from. Give me a little bit of lay of the land of what has kind of happened over the last few years. Yeah, I, I'll talk at a national level. <clears throat> you know, nuclear power has traditionally been about 20% of the energy supply. Coal used to make up a, uh, a significant part, and then you sort of had natural gas on top of that. And then as renewables came on, uh, coal plants were retiring, uh, mostly replaced with renewables and natural gas. And then we started to see some nuclear plants start to decommission and retire, although many of them are getting extensions. And there are still two nuclear power plants under construction in Georgia with Southern Company. But that's a pretty stable mix, and, and it'll probably be there a while. And what you've really seen these days is a acceleration of coal plant closures. Mm -hmm. um, and that gap is being built up with uh, gas and, and renewables, pr primarily wind and solar, not a lot of new hydro. Most of the hydro in America is pretty well developed, so you don't see a lot of new hydro come online. But it is an interesting question. <clears throat> you know, every area in the world we talk about today, diversity is a good thing. And uh, I would say in the energy sector, this is one area where we're sort of going the opposite direction and that we are taking diverse energy sources offline and replacing them with sort of a singular thing. If you go look at uh, what's being built today, primarily it's wind and solar. Uh, and those are great resources. I mean, they're great because they don't have a fuel cost, but they have their technical limitations. Correct. Meaning you or I don't control where the wind blows. <laughs> I know your weather desk would like to say they get it right all the time, but, but we don't. And then there's just the natural, f uh, the sun rises and the sun sets. And so I think at the co-ops, Specifically, we get concerned with the overall reliability of the electric grid when we're taking what for a hundred years has been these sort of tried and true energy sources that we, we've mastered and managed to keep the grid reliable, take them offline, and then we're putting more uh, intermittent type resources to back them up. And what that does is it puts an incredible amount of pressure on gas supply. And as you saw in these recent cold weather events, when a natural power plant, and, and when, we, when, we, when we take gas out of a pipeline, we take a lot of gas out of the pipeline. When it's competing with home heating and all the other needs in the winter, that really stresses infrastructure. And, and we saw in this most recent winter storm right before Christmas where the gas pipelines will shut off power plants because they don't have enough gas. Yeah. So I think when you talk about diversity of power supply, I am, I'm in a 100% all of the above. I support all of the resources. And, and really look for ways to say, how do you make our electric grid the most reliable, affordable, while still trying to integrate new technology to really address 
emissions and carbon and everything else that and comes cyber out. Cybersecurity <coughs> has to be a part of that now because of the Absolutely. potential vu vulnerability, and you're talking about reliability. What um, so what, are you, what are you guys looking at? What, what do you look at in terms of kind of projecting out the next five years, the next 10 years, the next 40 years? Where, where's your vision for what you're looking and planning for today? For power supply? Yes. For power supply, what we are faced with at the co-ops is four large coal plants are slated to close in Arkansas. And, and we're, a, we're a partner in those plants. We don't operate them. Energy operates them. Uh, but the White Bluff power plant, which is 1,600 megawatts, and the Independence power plant, which is another 1,600, so 3.2 gigawatts of coal is going to come offline. White Bluff in 2028 and Independence in 2030. For someone who doesn't know how big that is, I mean, are we talking like a quadrant of the state? I mean, how many? Uh, how big is that? Real big? Yeah, it's a lot. <laughs> it's a lot. Okay. Uh, for instance, our uh, our total power supply, everything Arkansas owns is 4,200 megawatts. Gotcha. So you're taking 3,200 off. Now that's only, for us, um, we own about 1,200 of that. So imagine one fourth of our power supply is going away and that's the reliable uh, power. I would say nuclear and coal tend to be the most reliable because the fuel that you need to make the power is already on site. Natural gas, it has to be done real time and that's where we find all these problems. And then with, with Wind, solar, even hydro, to some point, they're, they're less. They're, th those are less controllable. As you replace things, as you build things out for this infrastructure for energy, um, you've probably been dealing with supply chain issues that have been affecting everything worldwide. What's been the impact of that? Absolutely. Well, lead times for critical grid infrastructure have skyrocketed. Uh, two years ago, if you wanted to buy a distribution transformer, imagine if you were going to build a subdivision. Home builder wants to go put in these, these pad mount transformers to run all the wires and, and, and feed the subdivision. They could probably pick up the phone and get one of those in a month. In 2021, that started to increase. And, and what we've seen by the end of 2022, if somebody picks up the phone to order one of those transformers, it's going to be over a year. Uh, in some where cases- they, Where are they made? I mean, where, where, where um, is that? They make, they're made. Uh, primarily in the United States. Um, actually, the Cooperatives of Arkansas owns a company called Ermco, mm -hmm. and we make about 450,000 transformers a year. I would say we're about 20% of the market share. Uh, seven domestic transformer producers make about 95% of all those transformers. Gotcha. But the issue hasn't been, you know, a lot of people would say, well, we're lacking these products. The factories must be struggling, right? Like they can't get things. That's not the case. Uh, Ermco made a record number of transformers in, in 2021 than it had ever made in its history. What we're seeing is, a, is a, just an explosion of demand. And when you think about all the billions and probably we could probably put a trillion on here if we added up all the, all the sources, all that money trying to transform the grid and electrify our economy and you know every time you put in an ev charger that's another transformer yeah. every time you put any of these things in it's, it's it requires this infrastructure plus when you're going to put in ev charging uh, or more homes wire size gets bigger so there's even been constraints on conductor so we've seen prices nearly double and we've seen lead times go out to one or two years and in some cases there are some utilities, no matter, no matter who they call, they're not able to get any transformers. And I think that is what has raised it to a national, that's why you're seeing it in national headlines. And I'm on a team that meets with the Department of Energy every week to talk about this very issue. Yeah. Uh, and it's a, it's, a, it's a challenging one to, to fix. We've got about a minute and a half left. I want to hear about the debate that's going to take part at the legislature over net metering. Um, define what you think is, is the argument, the de what's going to be at the center of that debate? What's the resolution you want to see? I think the, the argument really comes down to uh, what folks are paid for the kilowatt hours that they push out onto the grid, right? They buy solar panels, they use that power, they avoid their utility, they get the full benefit of that. Now the question is if they make more than they need and they push it on the grid, what do they get for that? I'd say I would point to California. They recently rolled theirs back because uh, to something called avoided cost. And that's really basically whatever I can provide it for or make it for at the wholesale level, that's called avoided cost. Uh, 
Today we're retail, so that excess kilowatt hour, that solar uh, net metering customer gets credited the full retail rate, which is probably about three times what my wholesale cost is. Gotcha. Because there's an expense to run the retail side of the whole electric system. Yeah. What we would say is that cost causers pay in these in rate systems, and that uh, we're all for fair. And so my job is to be reliable, affordable, responsible. I'm probably one of the few CEOs you'll ever get on this program that's trying to lower his top line <laughs> revenue because I don't want to charge people more right. for electricity. But this is really about who pays. And when you pay above avoided cost, which is the fair price in our opinion, and California just came to that conclusion. Okay. The, the reality is anything more than that, who pays for it? The people that don't have solar. Who are the people traditionally that can't afford to use solar? They're probably not the, uh, they're probably people that can afford least to pay more. All right, I gotta wrap it up there, but it you sounds bet. like the definition is gonna be over what is fair, is what the definition is. That's exactly be. right. Buddy, thank you so much thank for you. being here, always a pleasure. So. Appreciate you having me. All right. When we come back, we'll uh, include a preview of what Governor Sarah Sanders' education reform package may entail. Stay tuned.